can't touch this. Metal Hammer, the video magazine. It's going to be amazing. We well, hope, hope so. Anyway, it was amazing last time we played. In a way, we were a little bit concerned because we thought, well, it was so good last time. I mean, Eddie sort of better at, you know. So it's a bit worrying in, in that sense. But then we just thought, oh, you know, it's, you know, let's just go for it and uh, do our best. You know, that's all we can do is go and do our best. I'm sure, be, you know, I'm sure it'd be good. Donington '92 is. I mean, you can't say it's uh, the first time we played it because obviously it's, it's not. Um, but in a sense, the challenge I think is going to be to you know to top that first time. And uh, I think it's doable because I know that we were so nervous the first time I was. I mean, I was just in a, I was in a complete fog. For about the first half of the show until I, I didn't open my eyes, I don't think. I didn't dare look. It's going to be 10 years to the day that I actually played Donington with Ian Gillen. So I'm going to be pretty scared when we go up there, but I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be uh, very exciting for me personally. And I was there in 88 when uh, Maiden played, and I think that was a phenomenal gig, so I've got to try and match that. Really. I must confess I am still pretty nervous about it because I know that there is going to be this pressure and because uh, we have a, I think, a hell of an album to live up to, you know, regardless of our, you know, reputation, whatever, in terms of uh, just a band. So I'm a bit nervous about it, but I'm looking forward to it in the sense that it is our home territory. And I'm, whilst I'm nervous, I'm also determined to go out and just enjoy it for the day and, and just have a great time that day. Yes, all you lucky boys and girls out there may be coming to see us at Don Donington this year again, yes. Last time we were there, 1988, boys and girls, had a fantastic time. I'll never forget it. We actually started the set off uh, on time and uh, we finished 10 minutes early. And who got blamed for that? Donington is the type of place where 
if you use it properly, you can use it as a marvelous showcase, like I said, to use, you know, to, to get from one level to the next and you just keep stepping and stepping and stepping. And it is, Donington is the premier rock gig in the world, annually. And to not use that to its maximum potential and not to showcase the songs that I think are the key songs to give people a glimpse of what the Crimson Idol about, is about, it would be a, a terrible waste. I mean, there'd be no point in even going on. It's not just to play the gig. I mean, yeah, I want to play the gig, but it's, it's so much more than that. I mean, it's a special event. The whole world, the whole media focus of the world focuses on Donington once a year, more so than any other gig in the world. And I plan on using it to the best of my ability. We try to look at it from a fan's point of view that groups so often get to the point where they think nothing else exists other than their own point of view. And usually, I don't name names, but I'm going to right now. I saw Bono the other day in an interview refusing to play anything off the first three U2 albums. And I thought, you know, that band would have never been where they are right now had it not been for the people supporting them in the first place. How can, you, how, how can anyone have the gall to do something like that? I, I don't understand it. This is the first in a long line of ideas that have come from the Crimson Idol. Uh, this song, like every other element of this album, is not what it appears to be at all. In reality, people hear this song away from the album context, they're going to think that it's a story about a guy singing to a girl. In reality, it is not. It's a last-ditched attempt by a performer pleading with an audience not to let him go because he realizes where he's at in his stage or in the stage of his career that it is the beginning of the end for him. The first line in the song says, there's a flame, flame in my heart. A lot of people are going to interpret that as, as thinking that it's a relationship, again, to a woman or something like that. But that flame that he's talking about is that, that burning desire in him that got him to where he is in the first place. And he's talking about that that part will never be extinguished. The part that's bothering him the most is that he realizes that everything he's worked towards other than music has been a complete disaster in his life. Whenever we play here, we always seem to just have some of our best shows. I mean, be it the Marquee or the Hammersmith or, or Wembley with Motley Crue or Milton Keynes. There's just something about playing here, where, like this, I don't know, this vibe between the band and the people and the yeah. audience, and, and it just gets us nuts. Mm -hmm. And we just <laughs> go for it. I mean, we go for it every night, but there's just something a little extra when we're in London. For me, it's growing up on the English bands like Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and Black Sabbath, and Motorhead. Angel Witch, and Motorhead, and you know, girls school and all these bands that we grew up on. Like, cause we were like, I, I don't know, you and me especially we were way into that scene. That whole, like I was the guy running down getting the new Man of War you know, promo disc and I was the guy, you know, at the front of a Slayer show, you know, with King Diamond and shit, you know. I, I was really, I loved all the, all the heavy metal uh, that came out of the early 80s. And most of it was from Britain, like the early Twisted Sister shows and stuff. It seems like there's a the spirit of heavy metal in in Great Britain is is like kind of special, you know. It's not that the other places aren't, but I think that real heavy metal originated in places like Birmingham, you know, yeah. with Sabbath and Priest, and you know, that's probably why. Because every time I think of playing here, I just go, "Holy, we are playing England, man!" Yeah. You know, because they either love you or hate you, and they have the tradition with Donington, you know, with. Uh, all the great festivals, and so that, that there's a real tradition of heavy metal here that I think that we all can feel. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. As you can see, we're sort of in the backstage area at Donington, or the, the guest bit. Obviously, Donington 92 for us next year is uh, something that we want to be on. We were a bit disappointed that we didn't get on this year's bill. I mean, we went for it, but uh, we had a successful year and I can't complain too much, but next year we definitely want to be playing here and I'll be severely disappointed. I won't even come if we're not playing next year, I'll storm off and off, you know, that'll be it. And the day after we did the gig in Norwich, um, I was sitting in the house and uh, I decided I'd go up to the shops to get some food. So I went up to the shops with my wife Vanessa and I came back, the answer phone, message in the answer phone. 
And it's Tommy, says, guess what you're doing on August the 22nd? And I thought, that's my old man's birthday, you know, maybe, maybe he's coming down, you know, or something. And I thought, August 22nd, I just, just clicked, you know, I was like, ah, you know, yeah, I up nuts. People have never seen, a lot of people have never seen the backstage area, and I've, I've been lucky enough to, to pass two donors to, to get guest passes from the record company and go there. And um, I'll be honest with you, I've had more fun when I went as a punter in 1988 than I've ever had going backstage and hanging out with uh, a lot of people that might have been and wannabes, you know. It's great to see old friends hanging about there and, and, and drink the free beer. But at the end of the day, when I went in 88, I paid, my, paid for my ticket, went in, went down the front, watched Guns N' Roses and Maiden and Kiss and David Lee Roth and Megadeth and had the time of my life. So you're not missing anything. This young fellow here is our new guitarist, Pete Friesen, who some of you might have seen in um, Alice Cooper Band. And he's Canadian, and he's a jolly good guitarist. And uh, there you go. Yeah. Little story about Iron Maiden here. When I was 15 years old, right, this buddy of mine borrowed this first album by this brand new band no one had ever heard of called Iron Maiden. Put it on. To say the least, it completely blew our minds. And I just started playing guitar at the time. And I tore the thing apart, learned every lick, every song, every riff, all the bands I was in we used to play, all the tunes off that album. And um, all these years later, to be playing Donington in front of 72,000 people with them is just too cool. I used to come home from school, and I didn't have a big brother, so I was the big brother. And I used to play... Um, yeah, the kind of music I listened to was purple and speaking. I think it sort of shook me a bit, like that one. I had a couple of Cream records, and I liked T-Rex, really liked T-Rex. Still do, like the acoustic stuff. But uh, I think purple blew me away a bit. I was brought up, well, around that era, really, you know, early 70s, and it's when all those bands were really making an impact. So, I mean, I remember first seeing, like, you know, T-Rex on top of the pops, you know, and it was, I thought it was amazing. I, I was doing, like, Hot Love. And it was just that whole sort of image, and it was real cool. I really like enjoyed it. So the, all that bunch of bands that came out there, like Sweet, and there's like Bowie and Mud, and I mean they're great fun bands, you know. And um, what is they never took themselves too seriously. The music was, you know, they, was, they played and everything, and the music was really good. But the whole imagery thing was a bit, you know, for fun, you know. And I quite like that because sometimes it gets a bit lost nowadays. I think, you know. The bands that. that that I was into were all the, the sort of the big, you know, the big mainstream metal bands, you know, as in sort of Sabbath um, and particularly Purple. Um, uh, yeah, Sabbath and Purple, I guess. I wasn't crazy about Zeppelin. Um, and in fact, that when, where I lived up in Sheffield, the world was divided into Zeppelin fans and Purple fans. And uh, Purple fans were always a bit greasy and spottier and the Zeppelin fans are always much richer. I really, really loved the whole Ian Anderson, like the, where he played the, uh, the dirty old man sort of thing, standing on the one leg with the flute and the cod piece and everything. I thought it was great. And uh, it was a big Jethro Tell fan. Um, and also Arthur Brown, who I saw when I was a kid as well. And he made a, an enormous impression on me because he uh, walked on stage with this Inca headdress uh, with strobes, with a, a, the, the universe flashing behind him, and just sort of, it was like the voice of God talking to you from the stage. It just the most amazing stage presence and voice. Uh, and and I suppose, it, as a as a vocal influence, he has he has had a lot of influence on me, uh, and probably one of the reasons that nobody's ever really sussed it is because nobody's got his records. The first couple of bands that I really got into, you know, that made me really want to play was like uh, Zeppelin and Sabbath. And, um, you know, I used to listen to lots of other things when I was a kid, you know. But when I was like Zeppelin and Sabbath, that was it, you know. It just made me really want to play, you know. I saw Geezer again for the very first time uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, about two years ago. Uh, I was doing a show with the band that I had at the time, a band called Dio. Well, somebody knows about that band, I think. And uh, Geez uh, had come up uh, just to say hello. And um, I had requested that perhaps he bring his bass along with him because I would really wanted to, to do one of the Sab songs because in the Dio show we did some Sabbath songs. And uh, 
I told him it would be a song called Neon Nights that we had some great success with and was a lot of fun to play. So Geezer came, and uh, he did bring his bass, but it got lost on the airplane. So he never found it. Well, he found it a few weeks later. So he borrowed the nearest bass, and we did our encore, and it was Neon Nights. And I, I introduced Geezer, and it was great just to introduce him. It was wonderful just to be able to say, hey, I'm going to play with this guy again. And he came out, and he was, he was absolutely magnificent, as he always is. He was great. It was so much fun. So when, the, when that was over, the show itself, um, our next thing to do was to get back together as human beings, as people, as personalities. And we went to the dressing room and did what we usually do. We had a couple drinks, a couple bottles of Guinness, loosened ourselves up and just started to talk about old times and how much fun it was before. And wouldn't it be nice if we could do some of it again? Uh, Geezer then mentioned that perhaps Tony might be interested in that because, he, because Geezer was thinking of perhaps joining back up with Tony again. And uh, one chat led to another and probably about four o'clock in the morning we decided that yeah we'll we'll have a go for it so Gies called Tony and see what happens he did call Tony Tony was really receptive to it and uh, the rest is the history of this album Dehumanizer Symphony of Destruction is the title uh, of our first single coming off the album, and it's about taking a normal human being and you put him into a political state, into a position of, of authority, and all of a sudden they become uh, faultless, flawless, and they can dictate to you whether or not you're going to live in freedom or, or you're going to be living within the confines of a penitentiary. The new album's called Countdown to Extinction, and what that's about is the fact that we are slowly but surely eliminating all the different animal species on the face of the planet. And as we keep picking off these other life forms, the only life form left will be man. And when it comes down to man hunting man, he'll hunt woman first. It's no big secret that, that I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. Um, it's like, you know, people go to these places where they stand up and say, hi, my name is Dave and I'm an addict and an alcoholic. You know, that's cool for me, but I got to tell the truth. I'm a dope-seeking missile, you know, and, and uh, I'll find it wherever it's at. Before the last tour, it was really tough for me to be around other people that were drinking and smoking and smoking pot and smoking hash and snorting coke or doing heroin or anything like that because a lot of me there was a jealousy that I wanted to still be able to do that but I can't afford that luxury anymore I just can't I want to but I can't I still want to get loaded yeah I mean I, I wouldn't be an addict if I didn't want to still get loaded I just know that if I do that it's not going to be worth it the temporary uh, feeling that I get off of being high is going to be nothing compared to how long I'll be miserable you know, because, I mean, I haven't done heroin or coke in two years. I haven't smoked pot in over two years. I haven't taken any pills in, in, in over two years. And it's, it's like, I mean, I feel much better now. You know, I probably would feel good if I was stoned right now, but then I'm sure when I come down, I'd feel awful. Because uh, I don't really remember too much about it. Really, the last couple of hours, I've, you know, sort of had a few wits, and uh, don't really remember too much. It was really good. I mean, we had like different things for um, each song. You know, like Frank Ocean Strange was a rifle range. I'll be dead. We had this like thing, Iron Maiden thing. We get the, you know, go through the wire, and if you touch the wire, it gets, you know, get a shock or whatever. Watch this, see? I'm fucking go all the way, right? Oh, Fear of the dark was uh, just a, a dark room. Yeah, you know, 
win a ticket for the rifle range to go into the dark room to listen to that particular track. And there was girls going around with like uh, portable CD players, and then you, you know, they sort of blindfold you and, and play a certain track to you and, and, and stuff like that. And it was pretty interesting. It's good, you know. It wasn't just a normal type party. It was good fun. Donington 90. Very, very exciting. Very tense. Very, very tense. Purely and simply because we'd had... I mean, the album had been out since March. We'd done a lot of tours previous to that. Um, and so we were steadily building up a following. We'd also done um, the Heart Shows in May. We did Europe as well as, as well as the UK. And they went very, very well for us. And everything was just kind of building up and building up and building up. And then we went to Europe just beforehand. We did a tour with Love, Hate. And that was all really, really jolly. And we had some real good fun. And then we were just like ready for the big one. And then suddenly I went down with some mystery bug and ended up in all kinds of trouble. I couldn't sing a note. We actually did a warm-up show for in the week of Donington on, I think it was like the Wednesday. I think it was the Wednesday with Poison at Rock City in Nottingham. And, um, well, I, I, I knew before I went on that I wasn't going to be able to sing anything, but I thought, well, got to go for it. You know, went on and it was absolutely dreadful. And I can't remember ever feeling quite as bad. Problem was air conditioning on a bus. It's absolute hell for singers. And uh, we had a new bus driver who left the, uh, <laughs> left the air conditioning on, which, unbeknown to me, wrecked me before I even got there. So, uh, but anyway, that was it. But on the day, I hadn't spoken for like three days, totally. I couldn't speak. He gave me a steroid injection bottom, which made me feel a bit like a pin cushion, I have to say. But, um, so I hadn't, I hadn't even been there for the sound check or anything. So when we actually walked onto the stage, I had actually, hadn't actually been on the stage at all. So here we are! That's to be said, the crowd were marvellous. We now are absolutely, it was like an electric feeling. You can actually, there is actually a video of it. Um, and you can tell for about the first 25 seconds of the first number that, the, you know, the kind of, the unsure nature in my face. You know, I'm absolutely not sure whether or not I'm going to be at any notes at all. The first big note came and I hit it and then you can see my face light up. I mean, it's just like a huge, great smile comes across and the whole band just took off. I would be very surprised if we could do as well this year as we did then. Very surprised. I mean, it's, it's a very strong album, good, strong songs on it. Um, it's a very varied album. Um, but I would like to sort of live a bit, you know, a bit longer, maybe after the tour, I can sort of judge it against the other albums a bit more, be a bit more, more objective about it, really. But yeah, I mean, you know, we're really happy with it. And the fact that there's like four different songwriters on the album, um, Yannick's first time writing and stuff like that, just, I think, sort of made a few, you know, differences, like in direction or, or whatever, style of writing and stuff. Wasting Love is, uh... It's a song about um, how silly it is when you uh, start to grow up a bit, ish. We've, we've all, it happens to us all inevitably, uh, a bit. <laughs> Not too much, but just a bit. Um, how you, 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 you grow out of just being Percy Prong and like, you know, running around trying to shag groupies all night and stuff like that. I mean, it's all right if, you know, if you want to discover you know what the you know the ways of the flesh and the you know I wonder what she's like in bed the answer is she's probably much the same as a lot of other people um, and, it, and on a on a physical level most people are pretty much the same uh, and uh, the only thing that really means anything long term is is doing things with a bit of love and some affection and emotion and feelings and things like that Fear is the Keeps started out as being a song that was, um, it was, it was vaguely about the idea that, yeah, it started out being vaguely about the idea that fear of things was very much a, a motivating force in a lot of people's lives, you know, today. That's what I started writing some of the lyrics about, and then Freddie 
uh, Freddie Mercury died. And I was very uh, surprised uh, at, uh, at how upset I got. I mean, obviously you get upset when you think, oh, that's terrible. But I was really upset. I mean, I was, I was, I remember sitting down and talking to my wife saying, I wasn't even like the world's biggest Queen fan in one sense, but I really, really felt that, that him dying was something, uh, I don't know, it was, it was like an institution had gone. There was a, uh, something that Martina Navratilova had uh, been writing a couple of weeks before about the Magic Johnson thing when Magic Johnson said he was uh, HIV positive. Um, and she was sort of quite bitter about it and said, well, it's all very well for ma Magic. I mean, lots of sympathy to her and everything, but there's loads and loads of people like this. And it's like America's just discovered it because he's famous. Um, and that's where the line came from. You know, nobody, nobody cares until somebody famous dies. Whack. <laughs> Touch of wind, Yannick. Oh goodness me! <laughs> well, somebody just said to me that there's this problem, right, uh, with 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 um, certain movements within the body, you know, natural body sounds and all this stuff. Odors go along with that, I must admit. But uh, no, uh, Yannick. Uh, <laughs> Yannick, Yannick, isn't he? I mean, he's so ugly. I mean. You know, somebody as ugly as him has got to make stinky farts, have not they? I mean, you know, oh, yeah. But no, he comes up in front of me quite often uh, in during the set and uh, decides to take it upon himself to go, uh, and of course, depending on what way the wind's blowing, <laughs> I mean, this can be murder up there. But no, to be honest with you, um, at, uh, at gigs like Donington, we all suffer pretty bad nerves at, you know, at shows like that. So it, it, the air turns green around any of us, so. <laughs> Well, I'm telling you this, I've no idea. It's silly, isn't it?